um, a lot of project management and technical assistance support across various um, crop projects that we have at MSH. Um, I work with institutions and with CS organizations as well as communities in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the uh, Caribbean. And my areas of expertise are health planning and budgeting. I do a lot in health finance, cost revenue analysis, and resource mobilization. And I'm now very happy to start entering into the world of advocacy. Um, with that, I'm going to let my co-presenter, Carla Berdichewski, present herself, and then she'll present the first half of this presentation. Thank you, Eliana. Well, um, I will introduce myself. Uh, I am Carla Berdicheski. I'm based in Mexico City. I trained as a medical doctor uh, and I was always concerned about the, the inequalities in health provision. And that's why I went into uh, public health. I have a master's from the London School of Hygiene. And uh, for the past 10 years, I have uh, been an independent consultant working for a variety of NGOs, uh, UN agencies, and foundations. And uh, in these projects, I have designed and implemented a great variety of research and advocacy projects on sexual and reproductive health issues, um, not only in Mexico, but for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, and very much focused on maternal health. And I have been involved in a series of uh, projects on midwifery recently, and this is the fifth one I collaborate on. So uh, I'm very happy to first give you uh, an introduction on, on maternal health in Mexico. If you can have the next slide, Eliana, please. Um, for those of you that are, that are um, new to, to the scene in maternal health in Mexico, our maternal mortality rate is not very high. It would not be too striking when compared to other countries in the region or in other regions. It is currently at 36 deaths per 1,000 live births. However, when you analyze maternal mortality, uh, rates dramatically increase in states with higher concentrations of indigenous populations or with uh, greater poverty levels. And uh, these are the states where our project is, is based on. And uh, for example, in one of these states, Chiapas, uh, the, the current maternal mortality rate uh, more than double the national average. So um, a great majority of deliveries currently uh, nationally are occurring within hospital settings. And there are actually high rates of skilled provider attendance, uh, average is 96%. However, public health services are oversaturated, uh, there is a lack of personnel, and there are shortages in material and financial resources. There was a, an, an article published in The Lancet in 2016 by, by Miller, and um, Mexico is really characterized by, by this model of too much, too soon provision of maternal health services, where there is really a routine over medicalization of normal pregnancy and birth. And uh, this description includes really unnecessary use of non-evidence-based intervention, as well as a use, sorry? Diana, muy feliz día a todas las obstétricas. Gracias, Ana Clara, por, por hacer este trabajo conmigo. Eh, no estamos juntas físicamente, pero bueno, está en la sesión también. El, el trabajo que les presentamos se llama Efectividad de la Intervención de Profesional Obstétrica en Grupo. Hello. 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 Carla, I think we can continue. I think there's Go ahead, Carla. Dis disruption. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, the unnecessary use of uh, these non-evidence-based interventions um, are really harmful when applied routinely and are and or are overused. 
For example, cesarean deliveries in Mexico total more than 40% of births nationally, way over WHO recommendations, and can even go up to 80% in some settings. And as facility births have increased, uh, they have overstressed available human resources. And this has also resulted in low quality of care that in the end uh, translates into high prevalence of disrespect and abuse. Next slide, please, Elise. So uh, under the MDGs, Mexico fell short of achieving the two-thirds reduction in maternal, mater uh, maternal deaths. However, um, national and state-level governments have really remained committed to improve maternal health. And uh, the Mexican national government has officially recognized midwifery as an important strategy to address maternal mortality. And there is an explicit goal from the MOH to include midwives at the primary care level for low-risk pregnancies, but uh, with referrals to complications to the secondary level. And um, so in response to this government will, in 2015, a group of private foundations, NGOs, and UN agencies began looking into strengthening maternal health services through the integration of midwives. Specifically, the MacArthur Foundation made a strong investment towards increasing options for midwifery training, increasing recognition of professional midwifery and its benefits to maternal and neonatal health, and strengthening regulation and policy and efficient integration of midwives in the health sector. So there are many complementary efforts currently underway. Uh, as an example, uh, UNFPA is partnering with four Mexican midwifery schools to improve training for midwives uh, to a recognized international standard. And the program uh, provides skills building and works to ensure midwives are supported and championed by their local communities. Partners are also coordinating recruitment efforts between midwifery schools and local health institutions to ensure that graduates are fully utilized and placed in communities where they are most needed. So timing here is key, and investing in the training of midwives will have a lasting effect. By 2030, the target date for the SDGs, the population of Mexico will have grown by nearly 20%. To 143 million, and professional midwives can provide capacity and level of care that ensures a growing population can receive the care they need to ensure healthy women and newborn. Next slide, please. I'd like to give you a view of uh, midwifery in Mexico today. Uh, according to the State of the World Midwifery Profile on Mexico, in 2014, there were only 78 professional midwives that were dedicating 100% of the time to maternal and neonatal health. However, uh, nurse midwives that total more than 15,000 professionals in the country uh, currently spend a low proportion to none of their time on maternal and neonatal health. Uh, the country has 23,000 traditional midwives that are often accompanying women as part of the referral chain, and only in some communities remain as the only available and culturally acceptable uh, health provider. Given the few numbers that there are uh, 3.5 million pregnancies a year, professional midwives remain very insufficient. And most of them have independent practices supporting home-based deliveries, and only a few work within the health system. Regulation is open to professional mid midwifery, but must be strengthened. For example, labor codes permit the employment of professional midwives. However, national and state policies are currently lacking a definition of the role and competencies of a professional midwife. Professional midwifery schools are relatively new and have restricted capacity to a few hundred graduates per year. And university nursing programs have recently reviewed and strengthened midwifery competencies and training and will soon be graduating professionals with a full set of ICM competencies on midwifery. 
Uh, efforts on association are underway and newly established Mexican Association of Midwives have recently officially been recognized by the ICM. Next slide, please. So, um, as described earlier, this MSH project is part of the MacArthur Foundation efforts to strengthen midwifery in Mexico and runs from November 2016 to December this year. Um, the project's goal is to strengthen the advocacy capacity of midwives and key stakeholders to make compelling arguments that are sensitive to and, and effective within Mexico's political context to support the three pillars of midwifery. The project focuses geographically on five states that are highlighted on this map of Mexico. Uh, they were selected as they combine high levels of maternal mortality, as I explained earlier, but there is a strong political commitment to improve maternal and neonatal health. And they all have strong institutional capacity and human resources to build on um, in order to uh, conduct activities to promote the inclusion of professional mid midwives. My colleague Eliana will take over in a minute to describe the detail of our advocacy course that is one of the main activities of the MSH project, but I would just like to take advantage here to highlight that there are a series of complementary activities that are also taking place. For example, we have produced a documentary of midwives that has become, become an integral part of the maternal health team in a rural health center of Hidalgo. And also for the state of Hidalgo and in coordination with health authorities, we have produced this um, state level midwifery profile that is on this slide to be used as an advocacy tool. Next slide, please. Finally, and before passing the presentation back to Eliana, I, have, I leave you with this quote that illustrates the motivation of Carolina, one of the professional midwives that is part of the advocacy training exercise and works in the state of Chiapas, one of the poorest states in the country where access to quality maternal health services is often available to a very few. Diana, can you take over now, please? Yes, thank you so much, Carla. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so now let's take a deeper dive into what this advocacy course looks like. Um, the purpose of our advocacy course is to build the skills of mid-level health professionals to effectively advocate for programs and policies that integrate midwifery into the state and national systems. So we're offering this advocacy course in four phases. Um, the first phase was a virtual phase where we offered five two-hour virtual seminars. During those two-hour virtual seminars, we had different guest speakers come in from the um, central level Ministry of Health. We had people from some of the network organizations like the Safe Motherhood Committee, the Association of Professional Midwifery in Mexico, and we even had... Um, some people from other countries, midwives from other countries that wanted to talk about their success stories. Um, and during this virtual phase, we also asked that the participants do an assessment of what midwifery looked like in their states. So how many midwives they currently have, professional midwives, and um, what their maternal mortality is, for example, um, what kind of midwifery associations exist, policies. Um, and so they completed those assessments in that first phase. In the second phase, we held a one week um, in person advocacy planning workshop where we actually got all the participants together and in teams they worked on evaluating their the results of their assessment to see really what those uh, midwifery gaps were in their states and then based on those gaps they created an advocacy plan for the following six months. Um, and then we moved on to phase three, which is the phase where we're in right now, where they're currently implementing their advocacy plans um, in this six month time period. And then we'll eventually move on to phase four, which will be in October, where they're going to have a results workshop. We plan on inviting people from the secretaries of health, um, again, interested uh, CSO organizations, network organizations, and um, possibly other health professionals to hear about the results and the outcomes of the advocacy plans that the teams have implemented. Um, 
during the in-person advocacy course where we taught them how to do advocacy planning, I just wanted to put a plug in that we used the IPPF handbook for advocacy planning as um, a basis for our content for that workshop. Um, it was absolutely great to use that. Um, we are currently offering this course to six teams. Um, with a total of 22 participants, the teams come from the states of Chiapas, Guerrero, Hidalgo, Morelos, Oaxaca, and San Luis Potosí. Um, we designed this course um, for not just midwives, but midwives, nurses, doctors, and other midwifery advocates that are committed to strengthening midwifery in Mexico. And the reason we included not just midwives is because we thought it was really important that we have other cadres support midwifery um, and these advocacy plans. And the goal really in Mexico is to see these midwives working as a team with the health professionals in the different hospitals and health clinics. And what a perfect um, opportunity for them to start working as a team doing advocacy planning for midwifery um, in their states. Um, we also found that the teams, the participants in each of the teams um, already work together on midwifery in their states, which was a huge added value because we already had a group of people that knew each other and that were delivering or managing midwifery um, in their individual states. So during the virtual part of the program and then also throughout the rest of the phases, we um, created a group on our LeaderNet platform for this particular course. Um, in this group, we've been able to post all of the recordings from our virtual sessions. Um, we also have forums where we have the um, participants discuss the topics that were presented in the midwifery, I mean, in the virtual sessions. And then we also, right now that um, they're in their implementation phase, we're using this forum um, to allow them to update us on how the implementation of their advocacy plans are going. Um, one thing we did find about doing this first uh, virtual phase is that I think the participants were a little timid in the beginning to participate in the virtual sessions and even in the virtual platform. Um, I think that maybe, well, in discussing with them during the face-to-face -face workshop, I think they found that it was not necessarily a methodology, the virtual platform that they're used to using, and so it took a little bit of warming up for them. Um, so that was good feedback that we got. And um, we also decided to put strict homework assignments and deadlines for when they need to listen to the virtual sessions if they weren't able to attend um, in the live sessions. And I think we also had a lot of um, discussions with the teams just behind the scenes, which little by little, they became a lot more active and warmed up to the platform and started becoming um, incredibly participative. Um, the only other thing I'll say about this virtual platform is that right now we're um, hoping at the end of this course to transfer all of the content and the material to a platform that the um, investigative, well, in Spanish, it's Investigación en Salud and Demográfica. In SAD, it's a local consulting group in Mexico that created a midwifery platform for Mexico. And so the idea is that we're able to transfer this onto their platform so that in the future, this course can be offered. Um, we'd like to package the methodology for all of the phases so that people in the different states could eventually offer this or maybe even the institute um, of public health or the UNFPA um, in Mexico could replicate this for um, other states. Since right now we're only working with those five. Um, so just to give you a sense of what the advocacy plan topics are, um, we have advocacy plans that are focused on decreasing obstetric violence, um, some on increasing municipal funding and support, um, some to develop midwifery champion groups, um, and then others to establish standard op operating procedures for once a midwife graduates, how you um, insert them into the overall health system. Um, what we found was interesting, actually, with this group of participants is that it, it took them a while to really, really understand what we meant by advocacy planning and what advocacy was all about. Um, and I think what's been great about the way we designed this program is that they got a lot of theory 
during the virtual sessions and even the um, face-to-face workshop. Um, And now that they're actually doing the implementation, they're really seeing not just what advocacy is, but what it looks like in the implementation phase. And they're really starting to see how important it is um, to have constant follow-up of your advocacy activities, how to be persistent and resilient in the face of adversity. And so I think that's been a very valuable part of this, um, of this course. So moving on to the next slide, um, these are our formal expected results that we're looking at in the short and the long term. We want to see that you know our participants complete the course and that they were able to develop and successfully implement their advocacy plans. And in the longer term, we'd like to see um, the that out of all of the. Oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, replicated. But in the longer term, what we want to see is that whatever focus they have on their advocacy plans, that they're able to actually influence policy and influence their environment over time. Um, We understand that in a six month implementation period, we're probably not gonna see a whole lot of policy changes um, in that time period, but there's still a lot I think that we can see in terms of like the capacity building that we're doing for these midwives and for these participants. And the other thing I would just like to say is um, some of our recent results um, have been just seeing that the different groups from the different states are for the first time really communicating across states and sharing knowledge and experience. And that was very valuable in the in-person session. And now that they've all met each other in person, um, it's great to see them discuss virtually Um, you know, just what their experiences have been so far. And I think that a lot of the states have very similar um, challenges when it comes to midwifery. And in fact, some of the advocacy plans are are similar across states. And so this whole initiative has just really been great for them to share those kinds of experiences and lessons learned. Um, We also have some states that have um, less midwifery in their states than others. Some are a lot more advanced in terms of the degree of uh, midwifery integration into their health system. So I think it's also been great for those teams or for those states that are a little bit more behind to really learn for from the other states uh, that are more advanced as to, you know, how they um, made all those um, successes happen. Um, And, you know, what are the different activities that they're currently doing to continue building midwifery in those individual states. Um, Currently right now, what pretty much all the teams um, have gotten is they went back to their states and they've obtained local buy-in for their advocacy plans and obviously getting more and more stakeholders on board. Um, They've continued to revise and perfect their advocacy and M&E plans um, as they implement them. Um, And a lot of them are just starting with all of their stakeholder meetings and really starting to influence policy, um, which has been really great to see as well. Um, So we have quite a few lessons learned before um, I end. Um, So the selection process um, was, um, it took a bit of time, but I, we realized, I think, after having gone through it, how important it was to spend a significant amount of time identifying the right participant profiles um, to ensure that you're putting together an effective team. Um, in some states, we saw that we had a great variety of participants. We had the representation of midwives. We had some very high level people from the secretaries of health. And we had a lot of people that were managing midwifery in their states. And so I think when in those cases, we had a very strong and effective team um, where we had a variety of people that could cover those different roles that were going to be needed during the implementation of the um, advocacy plans. Um, In other states, they weren't as varied, um, and so I think they they have really faced challenges in how to move their advocacy plans forward. Um, We didn't quite nail getting those high-level people that could really open doors for those participants um, or for those teams um, once they go back into their states. And what we're seeing right now is that we actually have those teams integrating more and more people Um, that aren't necessarily in the course, but just really getting buy-in for what they're doing and really getting that support um, locally to help them open those doors. But I think um, definitely 
spending more time really getting to know what the participant profiles are and making sure that we have a diverse um, team um, was very important. Um, it also was very important for us to work in teams rather than having individual trainings. Um, over the years, MSH has really um, promoted this form of training, mostly because it's much easier for a team to go back to a work site or to go back to their states um, and really promote and implement the work that um, they're doing or learning in the training sessions versus having just one individual. And like I said earlier, it's also great that these are teams of not just midwives, but of doctors and nurses. And it's great to hear all these different voices supporting midwives um, in the advocacy plan implementation process. Um, the other thing that we learned about the virtual sessions is um, not all participants had great connectivity, especially our participants from Chiapas um, that are from more rural areas. Um, and also we saw that because, you know, we were working with a lot of doctors, nurses, and um, midwives that they, their schedules varied from week to week. And so we were trying really hard to nail down a two hour time period where we could have our virtual seminars. And we did Saturday mornings, but still a lot of people were either on call or working at the time. And so it was difficult for everybody to participate in the live sessions. And so one thing that we've been considering for um, for the next iteration of this program is to actually have the sessions pre-recorded and uploaded onto our site um, so that people could listen to them at their own pace. And what we would do is probably just have homework assignments for each virtual seminar um, and have a deadline for when they have to listen to the virtual seminar and complete the homework assignment so that we know they listen to it. And then also the homework assignments are basically discussion questions on our forum to really generate discussion across the different participants. Um, and so that was just another lesson learned that it would be, be great to just give them that um, opportunity to have more of the self-paced virtual sessions. Um, the other is the that we learned is in terms of expected results um, versus the time frame that we had. So this is a one year um, course. We started in October. We're going to end of uh, last year, and we're going to end in October of this year. However, the implementation period for the advocacy planning is only six months, and so our expected results really had to change uh, thinking about that. What we're really trying to accomplish here is that we increase the capacity of midwives to be able to advocate for themselves and for the services that they offer. And so I think that in that six-month time period, we can definitely measure that, the degree of um, capacity building that we achieved. Um, but like I said earlier in our results page, it's, it's going to be difficult for us in the six-month time period to see things like policies changing um, in their states. It, who knows, it may happen, and that would be amazing. And I'm sure there are other things um, that are going to happen, like them being able to create a more enabling environment for midwifery by creating more champion groups, for example. Um, but definitely, you know, if, if in offering this, you really want to see that policy change as a result of the advocacy work, it is important to give a lot more time during the implementation period of their advocacy plans. So that was another um, lesson learned. Um, and then also the elections are going on right now in Mexico and we didn't really foresee, well, we just didn't know um, that it was gonna fall within our, our time period. And so um, that was definitely something that the participants have seen as a challenge because they're trying to influence a lot of policymakers, but right now they're not sure which policymakers are going to be um, in their states after the elections. And so that has definitely halted the implementation of their plans. And so it'll be really important for future, just to kind of, for future reference, to look at these types of um, events like elections and see, you know, possibly how they can impact and compensate for that by maybe adding more time or maybe adjusting your start date of the advocacy course. And with that, um, I just want to end with this um, quote from one of our participants. Um, her name is Isela Barrera Cortez. She's a physician. Um, she's this one right here. And I really like this quote because it really shows you the motivation behind why those who participated are in the course. 
And she says, I decided to participate in the advocacy course because I see how midwifery improves the quality of maternal health services for women and their families. Because of this, since 2016, I've been advocating for midwifery in my state. Um, and definitely this was something that I saw across the participants and talking to them about why they were interested in this. Um, they're really committed to improving the quality of maternal health services and maternal health outcomes in um, their states. And I think that's why all of them are extremely motivated, enthusiastic, and participative in this program. Um, so thank you very much again for listening. This is the whole group of us. Uh, there's Carla and there's me. And then we have all of the participants here. This was during our in-person workshop. Um, I think right now we are going to have about 20 minutes, I believe, of question and answer. And Carla and I are more than happy to answer um, any of the questions about just the context in Mexico or anything related to our advocacy course. Thank you, Eliana. That was an informative presentation. I love your last slide and the quote at the end. Um, I certainly can appreciate here in the United States that collaborative piece where during your advocacy planning stage, you made sure to include uh, not only midwives, but doctors and other healthcare professionals. I think um, that's just such a key piece of this whole plan and can certainly appreciate that, that part of it. But um, I, I have other comments, but I want to make sure that we have time for questions from any of um, any of our participants. Please feel free to use the chat or raise your hand for questions or comments about the presentation. And Eliana, if you can um, throw the presenter piece back over to me, that would be great. Sure. And I. I couldn't help but when we were listening, when I was listening um, to think about the similarities at Frontier Nursing University, we have distance based community, community based distance education. And so a lot of our students are in rural areas and um, certainly have some connectivity issues for their the online piece of their didactic coursework. And so I was I had that question for you. How how did um, participants overcome the connectivity barrier if there is one, but you seem to have answered that. Um, and the other piece of that was just thinking about, um, it, you know, working professionals and how do you um, kind of adjust for that time and place bound piece of that, of that, of that work. Just yeah. they're in clinic and, you know, they are busy. So how do you get them all together to be able to collaborate in person or face to face? Yeah, definitely. Um, so this, I think, falls um, in one of our lessons learned in terms of our selection process and really um, um, being very careful about the participant profiles, because in some of the teams, um, we were able to um, get people from the same like groups to apply within the same state. So for example, in San Luis Potosí, we have a team of people that work in the same hospital and they're in the same office. And so that makes it really easy for them to come together and to find time to you know, work on their advocacy plans. But then um, in other states, um, like for example, Morelos, like they're you know, all working in different parts of the state and not necessarily in like a central location. So it is a little harder for them to meet, although they're very motivated that group and they every Sunday find a you know central location where they meet but that's just an example of you know how it, it's easier when you select people that are already in one team that are like in one location to work um, to work on those advocacy planning um, activities and then in terms of the connectivity so we did we did have quite a bit of trouble with connectivity especially um, for some of those states that don't have great connection and in, as a response to that we we did um, record all of the sessions and then just give them the link to how they can stream it and then they would just go online and complete some discussion questions. Um, and so that really helped a lot. And I think that's why this lesson learned about, you know, making the virtual part a little bit more self paced um, came out because I know that these are clinicians and that they're very busy and sometimes like even when they're not working, they're on call. And so um, giving them the opportunity to participate at their own pace, I think, would be really important for future offerings. 
hope I answered your question. Yes, um, that's a great, I that's a great point. Have, <laughs> yeah. And I don't maybe know if you have related, to add. related to connectivity, but not specifically um, responding to the question. Is um, it, it's been key to uh, maintain uh, motivation within the groups. So we've um, we fo we followed up uh, on the phone by email and um, really made efforts to keep motivation high and uh, feedback to these teams that are now off back to their states and working really on their own and we within these uh, newly created groups, but um, it's been key to, to follow up with them uh, periodically. Yeah, and I would add also, um, so in the beginning, I know I mentioned that they were very timid, especially on the virtual platform and participating in the seminars. Um, and I think that took a lot of like follow up too, to really get them engaged in the platform and in the course. and. Um, we had very strict rules for like who can um, proceed into the in-person face-to-face um, -face workshop. So it was, you know, people who completed their assignments, who attended or listened to the virtual seminars. Um, I would send like weekly updates to the entire group and then to some groups, um, <clears throat> to the entire group of participants and then to separate groups and then you know, if I saw that there was an individual that really just wasn't active or participating, I would have, you know, my own call with that person, or I would reach out to that person to see, you know, how best we could support um, him or her so that they could, you know, be more active. And some people just realized that they really did not have the time and um, they dropped out of the course, but it's good to see that they're actually a lot of them are still supporting their teams um, in some of the implementation activities that they're doing. Um, so yeah, I think I agree with Carla, like it did take a lot of um, persistence and a lot of following up and like she said, not just over email, but also over the phone, over WhatsApp. So um, it did take a lot of that. Thank you both for that, for that insight. The, the pearls of wisdom from your, this process, I know will be <laughs> special part of this presentation for viewers. Does anyone else have questions or comments for the presenters? Well, uh, I certainly do want to thank Eliana and Carla for uh, their work and for presenting. I know the long-term results of this will have a greater health impact. Um, it will be interesting to, to, it would be nice to hear an update later and see how the groups are doing. And um, it's such special work. So certainly thank you both for that. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I am going to stop the recording now. And well, we appreci you. appreciate everyone's participation. Yes, we do. And for those midwives that tuned in, we so appreciate all of the work that you do for um, women, children, and families all around the world. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> thank you very much, Carla. We appreciate your time this morning also. Thank you for the space. I, it's been a, a very um, rewarding experience to see these midwives and these midwifery groups empowered uh, and uh, moving on towards uh, new goals in, in midwifery in Mexico. So thank you for the space and uh, we'd, uh, we'd welcome any further questions after this talk if there are any. So thank you for having us. Definitely. Thank you, so powerful. Thank you.